Hello, and welcome to today's edition of our seminar series on multidimensional poverty with the uh, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative at Oxford University and the United Nations Development Program's Human Development Report Office. We're delighted to be hosting Maria Emma Santos today and co-authors for her presentation. We will begin shortly uh, when I turn the panel over to my colleague, James Foster, Professor of International Affairs, and Oliver T. Carr, Professor uh, at the George Washington University. I should have said a Professor of Economics and Oliver T. Carr, Professor of International Affairs. So James, without further ado, over to you. Great to see everyone this afternoon or morning or evening, depending where you're located. Welcome to the series, Viewing Multidimensional Poverty from Many Angles. Coming to you today online from George Washington University in Washington, DC, with panelists in Argentina, London, oh, who knows where from. And uh, I'm actually in London. I'm James Foster, the Carr Professor at uh, the Elliott School of International Affairs. Um, this is the seventh and final installment of this term series on the Multidimensional Poverty Index, or MPI, jointly sponsored by Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or OFI, in Oxford's Department of uh, International Development, the Human Development Report Office of the UNDP, and the Institute for International Economic Policy in the Elliott School. Today, we're especially pleased to offer today's presentation, counting and accounting measuring the effectiveness of fiscal policy and multidimensional poverty reduction, which is joint work by Professor Maria Masantos of Universidad Nacional del Sur, or UNS, in Argentina, and Nora Lustig of Tulane University, and Maximilian of uh, Miranda uh, Zanetti of uh, UNS also. Uh, in just a moment, I'll introduce today's speaker, Maria Masantos, which is a particular pleasure for many reasons. But first, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this series, IIEP at George Washington, OFI at Oxford, and HDRO at the UN for their continued support and for sharing the power of measurement as a tool for addressing the needs of people. Last week, we were joined by Putu Nati, of FEB Universitas Indonesia and the University of Oxford, who presented her work on multidimensional poverty in Indonesia over a long period, with an enlightening discussion by her colleague, Dr. Deva Wisana, also of FEB UI. This one today is the last event of the seminar. Now, today we're pleased to have today from uh, uh, joining us from Argentina, one of the architects of the global MPI, of the Latin American regional MPI, and many other contributions to the field, Maria Emma Santos. I was first introduced to Maria Emma by Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, the current head of poverty at the World Bank, who back then was running a public policy center at Universidad de las Americas in Puebla, Mexico, otherwise known as UDLA, whose rectora, incidentally, was Nora Lustig, who's joining us today. Luis Felipe invited me to Puebla for a conference on spatial inequalities, and there I found a precocious undergraduate student from Argentina who happened to be presenting her research. He advised me, Luis Felipe, that is, to meet her and remember her as she was going places. And indeed, with a helpful grant from the National Scientific and Technological Research Council of Argentina, or CONICE, uh, uh, she joined my master's program at Vanderbilt in 2004, acting far more like a PhD than a master's student. In this, she was reminiscent of a certain student from Bangladesh who joined the same master's program at Vanderbilt some 40 years earlier, namely Dr. Muhammad Yunus, who I mentioned before. After the master's, Mariema returned to UNS where she received her PhD with me as an external advisor. She soon joined Oxford's Ox, uh, OPHI, OFI, and the rest, as they say, is history. She is currently professor at the Department of Economics at UNS, a researcher at CONICET, 
and a research associate at OFI. She's made fundamental contributions to multidimensional poverty measurement, to our understanding of empowerment, human development, human capital, and even chronic poverty. Welcome, Mariama. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Foster, for such a nice introduction. Um, so let me share with you the presentations we have, the presentation we have for today. Um, I'm very pleased to present um, this paper, which as Professor Foster said, is joint work with Professor Nora Lusik, the director of the Commitment to Equity Center at Tulane University, and Maximiliano Miranda Fanetti, a colleague from my institute. And let me say that we are very thankful because this research paper was possible thanks to the generous support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We all know that reducing multidimensional poverty is an explicit priority of the 2030 agenda, and governments make, make efforts to achieve that. So exposed, one may ask, has a certain fiscal effort made its best at reducing multidimensional poverty? And we may also ask ex ante, what would be the best allocation of a certain budget to reduce multidimensional poverty? So this paper brings together two methodologies, the counting approach um, to multidimensional poverty measurement methodology developed by Sabine Alcara and James Foster at OFI with the fiscal incidence analysis methodology developed um, at the Commitment to Equity Center led by Nora Lustig, which is within the accounting approach to fiscal incidence analysis. And we bring these two methodologies together for the analysis of the effectiveness of fiscal policy on multidimensional poverty reduction. Let me go through quickly first uh, through the AF methodology, which we all know. Um, but in this case, we will think um, of two periods of time. We will have achievement matrix at moment T0 and at moment T1. And I would like to emphasize that in this case, we will think of each row of the matrix being a household. And naturally, each household will have a household size. We will have deprivation cutoffs, indicators weight. And so a household is deprived in indicator J whenever its achievement is below the deprivation cutoff. With that, one can construct the deprivation matrix, which will have ones whenever there is a deprivation and zero otherwise. And one can compute the household deprivation score, which is the sum of the weighted deprivations the household experience. A household is identified as poor whenever that deprivation score is equal or higher, higher uh, than a poverty cutoff value called K, which can range from the minimum uh, weight in indicators uh, received, that would be a union criterion, to the intersection criterion, requiring to be deprived in everything to be identified as multidimensionally poor. Most commonly, intermediate um, values are used. After identification, the deprivations of the non poor need to be censored. And so we will have the census deprivation matrix, uh, which will take values once for the poor and deprived and zero otherwise. And we will have the census deprivation score. And so the aggregation, we will focus on the M0 uh, measure of the family of multidimensional poverty measures, um, which in um, for simplicity, we will refer to as an MPI, which is the product of incidence times intensity, and um, that is the sum of the deprivation scores of the households. There are T households in each period, weighted by their um, household size, divided by the total population. So that's um, a glance through the AF method. Now, what about the commitment to equity methodology? Well, for fiscal incidence analysis, the idea is that one starts from a pre-fiscal income. This is within the income space. With one starts with the pre-fiscal income, which essentially is market income. And then one needs to add, um, add benefits and subtract uh, taxes 
to get different concepts of post-fiscal income, disposable income, consumable income, final income. As simple as it may sound, this is actually a very complicated and challenging task that involves implementing a variety of tools to obtain each of those um, income concepts. Next, with those income distributions, one can compute different kinds of indicators that will tell us about the incidence of the um, fiscal intervention. We will focus on three, actually on two of SEC um, distinguished indicators. One of them is the marginal contribution indicator. Um, let's think in terms of poverty and thus in terms of uh, benefits, but this can also be computed for taxes. And the marginal contribution of a benefit or a set of benefits is computed um, calculating a poverty index, or it could also be an inequality index, over an income distribution without that benefit, minus the same index computed over a distribution with that benefit. So whenever that difference is positive, that, that transfer, that benefit is poverty reducing, and otherwise it's not. Ali and Nami also proposed two additional um, indicators within SEC indicators. One of them is the impact effectiveness indicator, which com compares the observed marginal contribution um, in terms, for example, of poverty reduction of a certain benefit with the optimal marginal contribution that same benefit could have achieved. A dual indicator of that is the spending effectiveness, which compares the observed amount of uh, benefit that has been spent, that has actually been spent, with the minimum amount of benefit that could have been spent to achieve the same observed poverty reduction. Now, how are those optimal distributions computed in the unidimensional case? Well, again, let's consider the case of the benefits and the idea is that one would need to increase the income of the poorest poor individual with a benefit until her income becomes equal to the income of the second poorest poor, and then equal the income of those two poorest poor to the income of the third poorest poor, and so on, until the total available budget is exhausted. So the idea is that the budget is distributed uh, within the J, num a J number of poorest poor individuals, such that all their incomes are equalized and the uh, original ranking is preserved. Now, it's worth noting that the cardinality and continuity of the income variable enables the total available budget to be divided into infinitesimal parts if necessary to produce that optimal allocation, something that we won't have in the multidimensional case where we have a lot of discreteness. So how can we think about analog indicators, analog of those indicators in the multidimensional case? One first key question is, what is our pre-fiscal distribution? We observed, we observed matrices of achievements, but what would have been the achievements um, if the state hadn't intervened, if there hadn't been a certain um, fiscal intervention? Well, that's a difficult question, certainly. One practical way to deal with that that we have thought is to make use of repeated cross-sectional data. And we may understand that the achievement matrix at a moment T0 is the pre-fiscal matrix of achievement of a achievement matrix in T1. Now, this is plausible or reasonable depending on the indicators that we are considering in that matrix. Uh, they need to be indicators whose change over time can only be reasonably attributed to the fiscal intervention of the state. One, uh, a set of natural candidates for that are access to basic services, water, a piped water, sewage sanitation, electricity, gas. Well, accessing those networks clearly needs the action of the state. So if we um, accept that, <clears throat> let's consider the matrix of achievements at two points in, two points in time, T0 and T1. Let's 
think of a multidimensional property measure computed in T0 and in T1. And let's assume that there's has, there has been a reduction in multidimensional poverty, which we'll call delta MP between T0 and T1, and that that has been achieved with a certain budget B the government has spent to eradicate certain deprivations. So our analog indicators in the multidimensional case we propose are these. Let's compare what has been the observed uh, multidimensional poverty reduction with an optimal poverty reduction, which we'll define in a minute. The idea is, could the fiscal intervention have achieved a higher poverty reduction than the observed one with the same budget? And the dual indicator is the spending effectiveness. And we can compare, okay, what has been the observed spent budget? What would have been the minimum budget to achieve that observed uh, poverty reduction. Now, one first fundamental difference in the multidimensional case as compared to the unidimensional case is that now we need, obviously, removing deprivations have, e removing each deprivation has a different cost. Removing electricity deprivation, removing water deprivation, and so on, so on, each has, each will have a different cost. So we need to think two things simultaneously. First, not first, simultaneously, we need to consider which deprivations to lift, how to allocate money across dimensions, and at the same time, to whom should these deprivations be lifted? Which households should be prioritized? We propose uh, to use an MPI, an M meaning an M0 measure, uh, as a metric for evaluation. As long as this is composed of indicators, as I said, that can be influenced by the intervention of the state. Using an MPI avoids the perverse incentives of prioritizing the least intensely poor if we used age, which would happen if we used the headcount ratio. And it also avoids the somehow opposite perverse incentives of using only poverty intensity, because that would lead us to reduce intensity as long, one, as, long as no one leaves poverty. However, um, we know that M0 is not sensitive to inequality among the poor. So maximizing its reduction does not guarantee that the poorest poor households are lifted deprivations. For this reason, we will propose two alternative criterion, criteria for optimality. Before getting to that, let me say a word on costing. Naturally, the costing of removing each deprivation will play a critical role in defining the optimal distribution. Um, let's think, in, in this paper, we think in terms of indicators that reflect shared deprivations of, for the households, as I said, mainly lack of access to services, to basic services. So we will think in terms of per household cost of removing each J deprivation, and we will call that, that PHC, per household cost of the J deprivation. So it would be how much does it cost to connect a household to the water network, for example. I know you may be thinking that there may be economies of scale, so those PHC are, should not be independent across households, should perhaps increase as more households are connected to networks. There may also be technical complementarities, bringing water and sanitation, for example. Well, these issues can be incorporated um, in our scheme. We will work with PHC, but let me say first that although it's true that in many occasions there will be uh, economies of scale, in many others they will not. Um, there are many cities in developing countries that have the main water network there, and not all, all neighborhoods are connected. Perhaps they are 200 meters away from the main network, and yet they are not reached by them. So those are secondary connections. And in those cases, the PHC approach may not be so unreasonable. unreasonable. But also, if there are uh, significant investments that need to be done, it should be possible to estimate the minimum number of households that would need to be connected to achieve a certain per household cost. And in that case, one could incorporate that minimum number of connections to be done as a constraint into the optimization process. Also, one can um, create this PHC 
for different areas. So one would have different per household cost of uh, connecting each services, depending whether it is a rural area or an urban area, and even within urban areas, depending on how remote is the area. So that could also be incorporated. For this presentation, we will keep the simplicity of using PHP. Okay, so how are the two alternative optimal criteria we propose? Actually, they use the same uh, principles. The difference is that they go in different order, in inverse order. One criterion, we call it the Max and Lenov criterion, because it first prioritizes reaching the greatest possible reduction in MPI, that is removing the privations to the greatest possible number of people. And as a second order guiding principle, um, remove the privations in decreasing order of poverty intensity, considering the leave no one behind, that's the LINO uh, acronym, pledge of the 2030 agenda. So given two households of equal size, um, the poorest one would be prioritized. The um, alternative criterion is doing the things the other way around. First, um, uh, putting as the, as the first guiding principle, removing the privations in decreasing order of poverty intensity. So the first guiding principle would be the leave no one behind pledge. And second order, given two households with equal deprivation score, giving priority to the biggest household, so reaching the greatest possible number. Of course, if identification and costing is done at the individual level, the two criteria coincide. Or alternatively, if we do it at the household level, but we ignore the household size, again, the two criteria coincide. So we have two proposals of optimal criteria, which can be up in, applied to the impact effectiveness of or spending effectiveness exercise. But we also need to consider one further technicality which is whether we use a union cutoff or something different, an intermediate or an intersection in the extreme. Um, I will focus this presentation on the applications to the impact effectiveness, but the spending effectiveness are the dual exercise for time constraints. So let's think about first, how would the criterion of Max and Lenov be implemented using, using first a union poverty cutoff for impact effectiveness. As I said, let's assume we have T0, T1. Let's assume there has been a poverty reduction of size DM. For the moment, for, for uh, uh, yeah, going through the presentation, let's think as if we had panel data, meaning as if there, has no, there hasn't been any population growth and we have the same number of households and the same composition. I will make a comment on this at the end, but for the moment, uh, follow me with this assumption. Um, and so if we assume that no change in N, no change in number of households and uh, union poverty at all, the change in the N0 measure is given by this expression in which we have G0, T0 in the J deprivation minus G0, T1. Whenever this is a one, it means that a deprivation has been removed between T0 and T1. Um, weighted by the size of that household, added across households, weighted by the um, uh, indicator's weight, added across the different indicators, divided by N. That would be the change in the M0 measure. And let's assume that has been achieved with a budget of size B. Okay, so the question is, for impact effectiveness, could the fiscal intervention, intervention have achieved a higher poverty reduction than the M with the same budget B? Well, it's nice to find that that's actually a linear programming problem, which can actually be solved quite easily with a software like Mathematica, for example. One needs to find the sets of households, RJ, it's a set for each deprivation, of households for which that J deprivation is removed, and that those each of those uh, sets has a size of TRJ, which is the number of households to which deprivation J is removed. Okay, find those sets such that the expression I stated before is maximized subject to 
the budget constraints, subject to the, the, the fact that the um, number of households to which deprivation J is removed times the cost of removing that deprivation to each household add up across all the um, indicators is within the budget. Okay, this is very nice, actually, mathematically is very nice, but it's not general enough. Because if one uses a K other than, that, other than union, the problem is that the removal of a deprivation can lift a household from poverty. Um, and even when other deprivations remain, those deprivations will be censored. And so those remaining deprivations need to disappear from the objective function. So we cannot solve this uh, with linear programming for a K other than union. What do we need to do? We need to work iterat iteratively. We will start from deprivation matrix in T0 and look one by one the most cost-effective deprivations to be removed to which household, remove the deprivation, re-identify the poor, censor, and start again. To do that, a very convenient tool is to construct a cost-effectiveness matrix, which for a K other than union will change in each iteration. And the coefficients, the, the cells of that matrix are like this. They are, okay, whenever there is a deprivation, we want to know how much um, a, a dollar is spent in removing that deprivation to that household reduces poverty. And so that is G0, whenever there is a deprivation, times the household size, times a weight star, I will tell that in a minute, divided by the cost of removing that deprivation to a household. Now, that W star, Y star, well, because if removing that deprivation still leaves that household poor, then it is the weight of that deprivation J. But if lifting that deprivation leaves that household from poverty, then the weight is much greater because it's the weight of that indicator plus the weight of the other indicators, um, because that household would stop being poor and the other deprivations will be sensitive. Um, we will see that with an example in a minute. So that can be operational, operationalized. Of, okay, that can be done in step with an algorithm in Mathematica. And we've, we've developed that. The idea is that one uh, constructs the matrix, find the maximum value, verify that the cost of removing that deprivation is within the budget, remove the deprivation re-identify the poor, censor the deprivations, recompute the matrix, and so on and so on, until one exhausts the budget or until the remaining budget is not enough to remove any other deprivation. That procedure guarantees um, the maximum reduction in MPI. Now, it does not guarantee that the poorest households are helped or removed any deprivation. So that's why we consider the alternative order of, um, of uh, priority. We will use the same matrix, but we will order differently. Now we will look at the maximum values of that uh, cost effective matrix, effectiveness matrix, but within the poorest poor households and remove the deprivation, the most cost effective deprivation to the poorest poor household first, if, if it is within the budget, then again, re-identify, censor, recompute the matrix again, choose the maximum number for the poorest poor, and so on, so on, until the budget is reached. So let's look at an example to have a better sense of what we are talking about. So we will look at an example of equal weights, but it can be done with unequal weights. And let's compare the two criteria. Let's think of Four dimensions, water, sanitation, gas, and electricity, they are equally weighted, but, the, but removing these deprivations, is, uh, the cost is very different. The cheapest one to remove, obviously this is all made up, it's a toy example, it's $400 per household to remove electricity, $800 to remove water, uh, then um, gas, then sanitation is the most expensive to reduce. One can compute weight cost ratios which in this case are, are obviously governed by the cost. But if we had different weighting, uh, then one, I mean, the, the order could be different. Maybe sanitation has a very high weighting. 
such that even though it is the most expensive deprivation to remove, it's, it may become uh, the most cost effective. So this is a, an order of, priori of priorities, which is only suggestive because we also need to consider it, um, the sizes of the households that are deprived in each, um, in each indicator. So um, suppose we have 10 households. This is the number of households, one, two, three, two, 10. Each household has a size and the total population is 40 people. And this is the distribution of deprivations at time T0. And this is the observed distribution of deprivations at time T1. The red zeros are the deprivations that have been lifted through the fiscal effort. Um, and we can see that uh, two households have been removed deprivation in water, one in sanitation, two in gas, three in electricity. So that adds up, given the costs, to a budget of $6,900. And uh, with that money, um, a reduction of 0 0.163 in MPI has been achieved. These, uh, the households are ordered from poorest to richest and within that from biggest to smallest. And this is the initial deprivation score and this is the final deprivation score. And here we are working with union K. Okay, what has those $6,900 been uh, well spent? Okay, let's look at the cost effectiveness matrix. For the union case, it's easier because it doesn't change all the time. So, um, if we look at the Max Lenov criterion, we can see that the most cost effectiveness, uh, cost effective uh, reduction would be to lift deprivation in electricity to these two households, which have um, household size of five, five people. Note that they are not the poorest ones, but they are among the biggest ones. So that's most cost effective. We still have budget. Let's move on to removing deprivation in electricity to this household and then. Uh, remove also deprivation in electricity to these two, and then water to this household number four, um, and then gas to these two households, water here, gas here, and we have reached a budget of 6,300. We still have $600 left, but they are not enough to remove any other deprivation because we have already removed all deprivations in electricity. Um, and the other deprivations cost, the minimum is 800, so we are done. Um, okay, that's an option. But as I said, um, these households who, who were the poorest ones were reduced, these two were reduced just one deprivation, whereas this household, which had a deprivation score of 0 0.5, you know, has also been reduced one deprivation. So let's think of the alternative of prioritizing the poorest poor. The matrix is the same, but the order in which we pick up the numbers is different. So now we will prioritize first these three four households, and we will remove electricity in these three households next. So that takes them to a deprivation score of 0 0.75. Next, we can remove this deprivation in electricity of household number five, because it also has a deprivation of 0 0.75 now. Um, next, we will remove deprivation in water to household number four um, uh, to also take it to a deprivation score of 0 0.5. Okay, and we continue with that idea and remove the red, uh, the deprivation selected in red, and that takes us, us to a budget of 6,900. Um, so these are how the, the two distributions, the two optimal distributions are left. And these are the deprivation scores of each of the two distributions. We can see naturally that the Lunov max n distribution, if you, you can see that no one is left with a deprivation score higher than 0 0.5. Whereas in the max n Lunov, we do have households with a deprivation score of 0 0.75, but it reduces MPI more. So which one is to be preferred? Well, we can look at Domino's curves in terms of H and M0, and expectedly they cross. We can see that um, for up to a K value of 0 0.5 in H and of a K value of 0 0.75 for M0, <clears throat> the max N Lenov distribution, which is the blue line, dominates the other. 
But for very high poverty cutoffs, it's the other way around. The Lenov Mac N distribution dominates the other. So um, going to the indicators we are proposing, here we've got the MPI, H and A, the observed ones, the observed reduction with union criterion, the budget, and the reduction that we would have if the um, budget is allocated following the Max and Lenov. And here is the reduction one would achieve if the um, budget is allocated with the Lenov Max N, which is a bit smaller expectedly because we have privileged the poorest households, not necessarily the biggest ones. Um, so with those numbers, we can compute impact effectiveness, which will tell us, okay, um, the government has been 61% um, effective. I mean, it, it achieved 61% of the MPI reduction it could have achieved under these optimal criteria. If we use that, this other criteria, it's a slightly higher, uh, it's 62% because the reduction achieved here is um, a bit smaller. Now, it's interesting to see that if we evaluate poverty with a sufficiently high K cutoff, we can notice that with the optimal Lenov max N criteria, poverty with K 0.75 or higher is eradicated. And so using that higher K gives us what we were looking in the dominance graphs, now, um, the optimal math and Lenov would say, oh, no, well, the government did quite fine. It achieved 75% reduction of what it could have achieved. But if we use this criteria, it would say, mm, well, it didn't, it didn't do very well. It only, it's take, you know, halfway of what it could have achieved. It could have eradicated the most intense poverty. Um, okay. Now, um, just to start uh, towards the end, uh, what if we implement um, the optimal criteria, but with over the censored distributions, if we use a K of 0 0.75? So these are the same initial distributions. The only difference is now we have blue zeros whenever we have censored um, deprivations. And the spent budget is the same. It's only that, again, we have censored uh, deprivations because we are considering for only those that have a deprivation score of 0 0.75 or higher. Um, all right, so what happens if we implement the two criteria here? Now we do need to go in steps to see the uh, methodology. So with the Max and Lenov criteria, we would need the first thing to remove would be to remove electricity to this household. Why? Well, because if you lift electricity to this household, this household stops being poor because its deprivation score will fall below 0.75. So that's optimal. Uh, next, this is optimal, again, for the same reason. We move to the next step. These two households, you know, they have, they still have deprivations, but these are censored. Um, so now we move to this one, and the optimal thing is to remove electricity to these three households. Um, and next, to remove water to these three households. Again, this coefficient is higher than here, because here removing water would move that household out of poverty with this K-cutoff. If we implemented the Lenov Max N, in this particular case, the solution would be the same. The steps, the order of the steps, would differ, but the final solution would be the same. Now, it's interesting to note that with these higher K cutoff, we eradicate poverty as measured by a high K cutoff with only 4,800, meaning that there's a lot of budget unused. Uh, in this case, the two criteria coincide and tell us that effectiveness is at 55, 56%. But one point I want to make here is that maybe that's not the best idea. Uh, it's better to implement the optimal criteria over the uncensored distribution. So, because there's still budget to be allocated, um, and so, and there are still deprivations to be removed, even though it's not the most intense poverty. So, once the most intense poverty has been eradicated, let's move to the second uh, most intense poverty. So, to conclude, um, Although these were two examples, the methodology can be implemented with real data, both, as I said, exposed or 
ex ante to guide a poverty reduction program. And it can be implemented with cross-sectional data. The only thing one, need, one needs to consider is that there will be population growth and that can be incorporated, expanding the survey weight variable in T0 by the population growth that there has been between T0 and T1, or by, if you are doing it ex ante, by the population projection growth. Um, okay, I can talk about a limitation of that, but let's move to the conclusions. Uh, one important thing is that the selection of indicators needs to be very carefully done. Reductions in deprivation rates need I mean, they have to be uh, they have to be such that they can be reasonably attributed to the fiscal action. Um, the weighting scheme plays a critical role because it determines the cost effectiveness of removing each deprivation. And two non minor issues is that um, you need to have estimates of the cost of removing each deprivation under consideration, something I couldn't get for Argentina. And that's the reason we don't have a demo for Argentina. But obviously, governments do have that information. And also, you need to have information on the public spending on those items that has been done or that plans to be done um, in quite disaggregated way, both in, both geographically and in terms of uh, dimensions and in which, in which uh, things will be invested uh, the, that project. So, uh, well, we hope this is useful for a better targeting of policy aimed at reducing multidimensional poverty. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mariema. That was uh, most enjoyable. I see what you're up to. Um, I can get a good sense of what's happening. Before I do, I should mention people, uh, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A if you have any methodological or broader questions or even get into the, the weeds, it's perfectly possible to get a good answer right now. Uh, but first, I'm going to go ahead and just jump right in with a, a couple of comments and questions at this point. Um, the first thing I should mention is that since we're in the final uh, episode of this series, that there was actually an episode, episode number two, um, which was uh, from folks in UNESCO, uh, one of them named Vladimir uh, Lasnyo, it looks like, and Hassan Hamil, uh, both were engineers. Both uh, were describing optimization issues with respect to minimizing poverty that would be part of your picture in interesting ways. So look, you know, I would get in touch with them. The discussant was, uh, Paul McDesey of Ottawa. Uh, so between that group, you can always go online and find out the names of the folks. Um, you, you might find some interesting discussion there that might be related to what you're talking about, different context perhaps a bit, certainly not within the confines or in the, in the um, sort of broader picture that you have with CEQ, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a part of it. It's that, you know, a kind of optimization that they're doing. So the part of part of what you're doing, it would be interesting to, to talk with them, I believe, uh, for that reason. The second thing is, as we talk about costing out or even benefiting out, but costing out in particular, um, these kinds of collective goods, it's really interesting and important to remember that the Shapley value was built doing just that. That's what the Shapley value was all about because could we attribute costs to each individual household? Well, maybe not if we have a collective um, device which we need to, to install in order to reach out to a bunch of households. And that installation depends on numbers of people in an area, it depends on lots of factors. Uh, in the case of the Shapley value or you know, original discussion, it was, uh, you can imagine a, an air, airfield that had to deal with different size planes. And if someone came along and had a different size plane, that was another social service level that had to be available. And therefore the, the uh, place where the planes would land would need to be strengthened more or less, depending who was part of that game. So there, there is some interesting question about how to deal with certain types of commonly seen collective uh, pricing problems 
in uh, you know fairness, collective pricing problems that might might be of some interest here. I'm not sure if they would be, but it just struck me how closely related it was to some of the issues you were talking about. Um, I think you know this is a, a cool idea because you're you're thinking about different, really getting in depth in terms of prioritization. That's exactly what poverty measurement is all about. It's prioritizing certain things. And I know that uh, Nora and I have had really interesting discussions in the past about, you know, does the FGT help you prioritize? Yes, it builds exactly that same sort of structure that you start at the bottom with the FGT2 and go up that way, the way you've optimized with, uh, with uh, it, you know, the, where you place the resources first. Um, whereas, and when we discussed it, we talked about, well, what about if you have only limited resources, who among the poor is gonna get it? Or maybe even if you take some away from some poor and give to others, is that something that's better? Those are, those are really interesting discussions. I do think that um, the question of prioritization is, is a difficult one when you get in depth into the structure of the, the indices, because you should actually be questioning whether it is, um, whether the prioritization implied by an index is indeed the one that should be there. And so I do think that it's important to continue using the measure interactively to understand whether it is doing what you want it to do at that point. That's just a broad conceptualization issue. Rethink, keep thinking about the measure. If it fails on a particular uh, case, ex you know, understand why it isn't getting what you're wanting. On the other hand, um, use it as a guide to help direct you uh, in general. One of the things that you could think about is there are measures that actually are prior to prioritizing um, at the bottom end, uh, the M gamma measures that one could actually go through and get the, the optimal prioritization that you've established as the optimal for that measure. Um, so that might be an interesting thing to discuss here or at least consider. Um, those are some of the ideas that I've had concerning your discussion. Um, I think one of the things that is really interesting about this is that you're talking about investments and investments, now it becomes clear, these are investments in people that have long-term payoff. And when you're looking at income-based sort of measures and discussions of that sort, income comes and goes. You know, you can provide that extra measure needed to lift someone up above the poverty line this year. Next year, what happens? So I think that is one aspect of what you're doing here, which is pointing out in sharp relief the difference between the income-based approach and a multi-dimensional based approach, you know, at least for some of the um, indicators within the measure. Um, yes. I really enjoyed your discussion of dominance curves and how it relates to what you're talking about and whether you know the budget fills you up to that K, that would that, that really, really makes sense. Uh, it's, it's good for linking the two approaches, the LNOB and, and MaxN uh, versus the MaxN uh, LNOB. I thought that was a really nice way of uh, expressing what's going on. I, I wish we could have different names for the LNOB <laughs> MaxN, I mean, Max Ed is sort of like Jeremy Bentham, you know, <laughs> right? Uh, the greatest good for the greatest number and leave no one behind. I mean, I'm sorry, those days under George Bush were nice, but I do want to leave them behind and a few other days behind as well. So <laughs> my apologies for expressing a political, you know, preference at that point, but I, but I do. Um, <laughs> I do think that the hard part of all this is costing out stuff. And I think that is the challenge. Maybe we have to be satisfied with approximate costs over regions, uh, average or you know, not marginal costs, but average costs. And if we're willing to deal with that so that we do better, you know, we do good, but not the best, I think that's a way to go. I'm gonna turn it over to the audience now uh, and see if I could, um, yes. Thanks for the exposure. Is the representativeness of the uh, sample important? Uh, this is a really good question because you're playing to the sample. 
And your examples that you're providing here are sort of simple crunchy ones where you have full information on everything. And when you don't have full information on everything, i.e. when you have a sample and there's a census of people out there that you can't ever see, you now have to start thinking kind of with those um, mistakes built in and how to minimize mistakes as well as to maximize the outcome. So I'll let you comment on those series of questions and comments. Proceed. Sorry. Anyone, by the way, whoever is out there that uh, would like to talk, the authors who are available. Um, okay, thank you so much, um, Professor Foster. Um, well, one thing is that, of course, we thought about um, M0 gamma. Um, we, we thought about that, I dealt with it, I incorporated it, I tried to, but the problem is that uh, it's much less straightforward because of um, Curvature. the square. <laughs> the square yes. is the problem. So, um, and here we want to allocate budget across dimensions. And so MPI by keeping that uh, independent, it's so nice, you know, arriving to a linear programming problem in the first place was beautiful. <laughs> Even though then it gets complicated with the non-union cutoff, but that is uh, so um, tractable. Whereas with the other one, uh, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be possible to compute those matrices of impact effectiveness, or at least, uh, yeah, not at the moment. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't know how. I, to I get that, and and in fact, the great intuition of uh, of Robbie Conber's work on op, on optimal budgets uh, used the FGT continuous measure and took a derivative, and that made his life very easy in finding optimal everything. So uh, here you're not going to be able to take quite a nice derivative because the variables kind of have has this discrete jump. And so it, it becomes a lumpy and once again, a programming problem as opposed to a really sharp, you know, different uh, differentiated outcome that says, if you're looking at FGT2, focus on if that's your optimum, you know, your, what you're thinking is, is your, your goal to minimize FGT2, Please look at the pair, at the places where you have higher FGT one. That was Ravi's intuition, but he did that by taking the derivative and he got a lower, a lower power. So yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, so so that was uh, the reason um, we had it in the paper, and in the end, I would say, well, that's for a second um, exercise. And then, um, okay, uh, thank you very much for the comment on the Shapley value regarding costing. Um, well, we certainly need um, to, to think about that. Um, in terms of the representativeness of the sample, yes, that's critically important. Um, in some sense, it would be ideal to work, for example, with census data, because there you have everything. No? You have rural areas, urban areas, all the desegregation you want. The drawback is that you have that every 10 years. And maybe, I mean, for certain investments, it may not be so bad as the ones we are looking at, but still 10 years is quite a lot of time, a long time. Um, in Argentina, for example, we have the household survey is collected only in the main urban areas. So it's really not helpful for thinking of an exercise of this, or at least it would be constrained, restricted to those areas. So certainly that's a key point. It's all something I omitted, but um, for brevity, brevity, but also it's important that uh, one would need to think about how implemented these optimal criteria within the whole territory of a country and how to prioritize regions, because obviously, uh, you know, otherwise one could have some absurd results as, oh, let's connect water in the north and then in the south. No, we don't want that. So it would need, and we have that in the paper, it would need to be um, implemented within certain reasonable geographic areas and how to prioritize those areas. It's a further question. Is it MPI? Is it age? Is it number of the poor? Well, that's uh, another policy question. Um, were there any any other questions or whether, I don't know, Nora, Matthew, you want to add something? 
No, I oh, just I... wanted to point Go out ahead. that uh, Vladimir actually has worked with us as well. I know him, so we can reach out to him and uh, see what, what complementarities, I mean, there are in the... Uh, I, I think that Mariema had... Uh, I don't know if you attended the seminar or you saw the the PowerPoint. Yeah. But... Mm. yeah. And uh, she realized that uh, we were working in parallel on, uh, and that there was some analogy on, on part of the stuff that we're doing. So we have pending to reach out to, um, to him. Um, so Fantastic. if I hear you, James, uh, you think we're in the right direction with this, oh, yeah. that uh, it could turn into a useful tool uh, it, it could be, without... it could be. Not to get too too caught up in the details, but if you can get good overviews and directions and rules of thumb, which is what you've been focusing on, by the way, you have different prioritization rules of thumb, really. And so to the extent that you can not get bogged down in the details, but rather get a general sort of um, rules that you can get from this, some intuitions, I think it could be really helpful for policymakers that are facing, you know, a, a really hard problem. And I should mention that that people have, in practice, been doing this. The the, the governor of Puebla did a full blown optimization to maximize uh, his impact on poverty in Puebla. So that was that has been done in the field. Uh, people have noticed this that there are, there are experts in governments who are doing this also. Um, one, one thing, and let me mention to you, um, it, one aspect that you may wanna consider as a further constraint is that in many governments, if you shift monies from ministry to ministry, people get really ticked. And so if you have sub constraints that say, well, within this, you know, this ministry, here's how much we allocate within this, here's how much we allocate. Within this ministry, here's how much we allocate. Make it all plain for everyone as to who's having to you know, sacrifice their part of the budget to get the job done. Then it, you know, it's a different problem. You don't get as good results, but you're potentially paying attention to a political problem that can arise if you pit ministry against each other. That's just one That's observation. Yeah, it's it's political economy, um, and I know how yeah. these things can work. One well, could well, compare well, what the restriction of having uh, this compartmentalized government uh, entails when you want to focus on particular objectives, and uh, what the, the the what does it mean also in terms of institutional design of government? Yeah. Right. Uh, one could go in that direction. So um, the Interesting thing that, well, I mean, no, Mariema, I'm going to let you, because Mariema is our leader here, so you, you go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I was going just to say that we made a mention on that, that there is a mention on that about in the paper, about um, that this may entail uh, reallocation of budget, and that may bring other problems. And also the waiving scheme yep. here plays a critical role, uh, and that's why when it's to be transparent or maybe uh, look for a consensus uh, on how to weight each indicator because it will uh, affect critically the optimization results. Now we were thinking, uh, Marema, at some point, uh, the challenge of which variables can be subject to this type of scrutiny. And there's a bunch of them that we yep. have not integrated. So it is a partial analysis of what uh, multidimensional poverty is. And uh, I mean, can we, I'm saying something very general, but I don't know if Mariema, you can put it in a sort of more rigorous context, see what James thinks about that. You know, Well, let's say, you know, we so, want to include income poverty also. There's a trade off there if you want. So how do you handle those? That's, those are really good discussions. And I, I think that if you conceptualize them in groups, service delivery, that is really important. So uh, I think service delivery is what you focused on here. And there are other dimensions that entail other types of 
provisions by government that are a little bit off to the side with respect to that. So characterizing those variables and calling them something so that policymakers can understand that could be really useful. Um, I'm gonna have to bring this to a close, but uh, uh, one of the great ironies of all of this is that we are talking about optimizing multidimensional poverty through budgets and dollars. In other words, what we're doing here is we're seeing how income affects directly through investments by governments, the lives of people, and also can affect the lives of people through gifts, through income transfers. But in fact, orienting it more to the sort of more permanent part of investment is something that now becomes much more clear, I think, as a result of your work. So I, I really appreciate your, your sharing it with us today. Thank you very much from thank our- Thank you. Yeah, thanks for uh, being here and uh, really appreciate it. And uh, be on the lookout for our next MPI series, hopefully sometime in another term.